Hello guys, welcome back to another tutorial. Hit the bell icon button so that you don't miss out any tutorial. Hello, and welcome to this introduction to Ethical Hacking course. In this video, we're going to be talking about subdomains. And so if you're familiar with the structure of domain names on the internet, you know that they essentially go in a hierarchy from right to left. And so if you're looking at say, mail.google.com, the .com top level domain is fairly wide. There are a number of different sites under it. If you go from .com to google.com, you're getting slightly more specific. We're now talking about a particular organization in this case, Google, and the domain that it owns. And then going even further down into mail.google.com, we're saying, okay, a particular part of their services, and you can keep on going as far as necessary, but in general, you only see two to three layers. And so um, these are called subdomains. Within a greater domain like google.com, there's a specific smaller domain called mail.google.com that provides certain services and features. And so in ethical hacking, having knowledge of an organization's subdomains is useful for identifying Again, their attack surface, learning what types of computers they're running, etc., and knowing where to look for potential vulnerabilities that could be useful during an ethical hacking engagement. And so in this video, we're going to use an online tool called Find Subdomains to take a look at Google.com's domain structure and see what sorts of information we can glean about the organization from looking at it. And so here, what we'll do is we'll type google.com into our search bar and hit enter. And so this is performing a search on the various subdomains that are under google.com. And so unsurprisingly, there are quite a lot of them. If you consider everything that Google does, from search engines to mail to cloud services to ads and tracking etc there's a great deal of different services and each one of these is typically under its own subdomain or may have many subdomains associated with it and so looking at these we can see the sorts of information that are available for this particular subdomain so we learn that webplus.google.com IP address of 8.7.198.45. So that's useful because that's a publicly facing IP address that could be associated with a theoretical client Google that needs to be scanned for vulnerabilities um, during an engagement as part of an ethical hacking report. Um, various other information here. And scrolling down, we see that there are no subdomains under webplus.google.com. And we have the DNS information, like what we've seen in previous videos. We see a standard A record, a 4A record. There is no mail server associated with this domain, no name servers, and two SOA records. And so this is a summary of this particular subdomain on google.com. However, this is one of many. They have a public DNS server, 8.8.4.4. Um, you might know better the primary Google public DNS server of 8.8.8.8. .8 this is a DNS server you can point your machine to, and it's designed to help you access the internet using uh, DNS servers. And so this is their most famous DNS server. You can see information about it. This does have a few different um, subdomains to it. So tower.shelter.com. Um, its address of Google Public DNS A Google .com, and a few of other subdomains that could be useful for scanning, reconnaissance, etc. Scrolling down, we see a single IP address DNS record, both IPv4 and IPv6, no mail servers, no name servers, and four different SOA records. And so scrolling through this, we see that there are a variety of different um, subdomains that Google's operating. And so having a knowledge of this is important for reconnaissance, again, because this gives you a list of 
IP addresses, domain names, etc., for scoping the effort associated with an ethical hacking engagement. And so if during your reconnaissance phase, you discover that an organization has hundreds of thousands of different subdomains, should probably appropriately scope effort, pricing, etc. for ethical hacking, as opposed to, say, another organization with only a single subdomain or no subdomains at all. And so this tool also provides uh, different levels of filtering for the results. And so we see 30 plus IP addresses, which if you click more, it gives you quite a long list. And also we see here some in um, sitter notation. And so these are summarizing different blocks that Google is operating in. And so this sort of information is useful because if, for example, you see a lot of similar IP addresses, for example, 64.233.172.2.3.4, etc., but maybe you don't see .1 or .5, it's possible that Google owns that IP address but isn't publicly acknowledging it in DNS servers. It may be intended for internal use only. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's only internally accessible. And so this is an important thing to keep in mind when performing reconnaissance is if those .1, etc. IP addresses exist but are intended for public use, they might not, may not be properly secured and they may not be as locked down as ones intended for public consumption. And so they're definitely worth determining are those IP addresses in use and are they accessible? And if so, to definitely give them some attention when performing vulnerability scans, etc. Because if they are lacking um, the appropriate level of defenses for public facing um, sites, it's possible they could be an entry point into an organization's network and allow an attacker or an ethical hacker to gain a foothold on the network for the next stage in their efforts. And so this is just an example of the use of subdomain enumeration for determining an organization's attack surface, plotting out the systems that are operating, their IP addresses, and even getting some information about their domain names that could be helpful for identifying their purposes. And so let's go back just to this first screen for a second. So we see like Web Plus. Okay, that might give a hint on what this particular one does. We see their public DNS servers, so we know these should be running a DNS service. And theoretically, not much else. If there's something else on there, it might not be intended to be on there, and it might not be as locked down, etc. And so subdomain enumeration, useful for determining what's running on a network and what that particular server is for. For example, what we're seeing here where we've got www.google.com. So we've got that hierarchy of .com at the top, Google right below, and then www even further than that. And so from this, we know this is a website belonging to google.com, and we're particularly on the www page or web server. And so on this particular www.google.com web server, there are a bunch of different web pages. And how these are organized is similar to a traditional directory structure. In fact, it's exactly a directory structure. You'll have a particular folder on the web server that is the top level folder for that web server. And below it will be additional folders, potentially pages, etc. And so when evaluating the security of an organization and their web presence, it's important to look not only at the very obvious intended for public consumption pages, but also the ones that maybe they're not intending for someone to be able to have access to, but might be accessible anyway. And so what we're talking about here is security via obscurity, where there's the assumption that since no one knows about this particular page, they can't access it, and so it's secure in that way and may not be secured in other ways.
And so there are a number of different ways to learn about the underlying files and folders on a web page. But sometimes a good place to start is determining what they want to have public and tracked and what they don't. And so if you're familiar with how Google works under the hood, um, when they're indexing the web, making their search engine possible, what they do is use a web crawler, which searches through all the internal links of a website. So you'll start maybe on google.com, find any links inside it, follow those links, follow links um, inside those, etc. And so this is how Google finds all of the different pages in a particular organization's web presence. However, an organization might not want every part of their web presence indexed. And so how you can tell Google or a web crawler not to index a particular page is to create a file called robots.txt. And so let's take a look at Google's robots.txt. And so Google here says, allow any user agents and, but disallow searching in the folder search at the top level, but you're allowed to look in search about, search static, search how works, or search, or how search works, sorry etc. And so just by scrolling through this web page, you can learn quite a bit about how Google structures its site and what it wants a web crawler to be able to access, not to be able to access, etc. And so for example, um, Google does like a Google Books site. And so um, and most of Google Books is specifically shown as disallowed. They don't want you to index buying pages, certain um, book searches, etc. Um, however, they are allowing you to access maybe metadata, top level information, related, editions, certain subject matter, etc. And so simply by scrolling through a web page's robots.txt page, it's possible to learn a great deal about the structure of the page and build out a map of which subdomains they're using, which ones they're not, and also which ones they want indexed versus which ones they don't. And so if an organization doesn't want something indexed, there's a better chance that that's the sort of space where there might be information that they don't want to be accessible to the public However, that doesn't mean it's not. And so again, these are um, particular targets for an ethical hacker because anything that um, they're intending to be invisible, not indexed, but that isn't properly locked down is a target of attack and should be covered during an ethical hacking assessment. And so this robots.txt provides a very high level view of say google's um, website structure you can go deeper into this there are tools as well that you can find online that will try to search for things not specifically mentioned in here for example um, you can search using brute force searches where they simply try a different combinations of characters for file folder names and page names to look for things that aren't explicitly mentioned. There are ones that use common words. For example, you might be able to find um, www.google.com slash groups by trying that particular word, etc. And so by building a map of an organization's website structure, you can get a feel for the attack surface and the number and types of pages that should be included in an assessment which is very valuable for reconnaissance. And so I'll leave you here with this. Feel free to play around, take a look at different robots.txt files, or use one of those brute force enumeration tools to get a feel for what's actually there under the hood on a web page. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If you like the video, do give us a thumbs up and share it. Also check out amazing discounts and offers on our premium courses in the description below.